Thank you for coming to our webinar where we'll be discussed newly re released findings on the experiences of LGBTQ plus youth in US schools from our, the, our 12th installation of our biennial survey, the GLSEN 2021 National School Climate Survey. I'm Joe Koskiew, I'm the director of the GLSEN Research Institute, joined by my esteemed colleagues. Hi, um, I'm Katie Clark, pronouns are she, her, um, and I'm a senior research associate at the GLSEN Research Institute. Hi, I'm Leesh Renard, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm a research assistant here at the Research Institute. And we are quite a team and have really pulled off quite an event with not just the webinar, but the report itself. So I'm really uh, forever indebted to the work of Katie and Leesh, and I forgot to say my pronouns, I use he, him pronouns. Um, so at this point, we're going to turn our cameras off. So because, you know, we, of course, will be the focus of your vision and we want you to look at the slides. And so, but we'll come back at the end when it's questions. Um, <clears throat> so uh, next slide. Just some housekeeping. I'm sure everyone here is quite adept at webinars and Zoom at this point, but just to let people know a couple of housekeeping things. You all are muted, um, but you have access to the chat. You'll see Somewhere on your screen, it varies depending on what product you're using to look at the Zoom. But um, you'll see a button that says chat and a button that says uh, Q&A. So um, if you have questions, as you have questions, as we speak going through, you can ask questions at any time, please type them in the Q&A box and we will review them and go over them at the end. Please ask us lots of questions. We love questions. Um, and, uh, and then you'll also see a chat box. So if you're like me, sometimes you put things in a chat with a question instead of a Q&A. So there's no guarantee that we'll see a question that you put in the chat, but do, we will monitor the chat, but um, that's if you have technical issues. So please write something in chat if like you can't hear or something's wrong. Um, and if you're having issues with your audio, you can join by phone by dialing the number that's on the screen and it will ask you, I believe, for a webinar ID number, which is there uh, on the screen as well. Um, and uh, I think that's that. Oh, here we have more things showing you how you can go through the, the, the chat system. So, and when you type in a QA, and I believe only uh, you see it and we see it. I'm not sure it goes public, just FYI. Um, but before we begin, I wanted to uh, uh, acknowledge the land that Glisten Research, uh, uh, the headquarters of Glisten National, but also Glisten Research uh, sits on. So Glisten Research Institute and its staff completed this work while on the ancestral home of the Munsi Lenape people. And the three of us are all in New York City, but in slightly different places. So some of us may overlap with the Wappinger people as well as the uh, Canarsie people. Um, but the office is uh, in the ancestral land of the Muncie and Lenape people. We encourage you to learn more about the indigenous territories on which you reside. Amazing website that we have listed here, native-land- sorry, dot ca. And you can type an address. It will tell you what is the, the ancestral land that you um, are on. Uh, in case you're less familiar with GLSEN, GLSEN uh, is the leading national education organization focused on ensuring safe schools for all students. We are now more than 30 years old, established in 1990, uh, and GLSEN envisions a world where every student learns to respect and accept all people, is able to attend and thrive in school uh, regardless of uh, who they are, their identities, uh, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity and gender expression. And um, we really seek to develop school climates where difference is valued as a contribution and as a positive contribution, one that it makes to creating a more vibrant and diverse uh, school community, but community in general. And we do that through our leading research, which is the three of us right now, but we've had a long, we have a huge uh, alumni family of GLSEN research folks who've been part of us uh, along the way. Through educational resources and training, our student advocacy and leadership. We think it's important for, for youth to have a voice and to make change in the schools that they are. Uh, and to be, uh, and uh, we have an office in Washington, DC, 
that um, uh, focuses on our uh, policy advocacy work and because it's education, they focus at the national level, the state level, and also uh, the local level. As you probably know, um, as states are, are central to what, what goes on in education, uh, state and state legislation and state governments. Um, and we really could not do this work because schools are local and change in schools is local change. Um, often with our 40-ish, uh, 40 40-plus, 40 uh, state and local chapters across the country, mostly volunteers who in, in addition to their regular day jobs really work a whole extra job doing work to improve schools for LGBTQ plus youth in their local communities. Glisten Research has been around for about 20 of the 30 years that Glisten has been here. And we support the organization's mission by conducting original research on issues of sexual orientation and gender identity and expression in K through 12 education and evaluating GLSEN's programs and initiatives. Our, what we refer to as our flagship report is the National School Climate Survey, which I'll tell a little more of the history in a second. Uh, and, but we have a, many other reports. We recently released a report on um, pre-service education. So those who are faculty in schools of education, like colleges and university programs of education, what are they understanding about LGBTQ plus students and issues and what are they teaching their te the future teachers and their classes? Um, we have reports on school mental health providers, LGBTQ plus headed families. So we really try to fill in all the knowledge gaps so that we have a three-dimensional a perspective of what's going on in schools um, with regard to LGBTQ plus issues. Uh, we also work with our chapters and student leaders and other school advocates in conducting local research and evaluating and documenting and improving um, programs and local efforts. And we have a online tool, the local school climate survey that we encourage schools and local communities to use to assess school climate in the schools in their area, because ours is a national report that we believe reflects much of what's going on across the country, but often it's important to have um, more specific information about a, your own school or your own school district. Uh, today in our agenda, we will cover uh, some of the survey background methods and sample, give you some key findings. The report is nearly 200 pages long, and I think the executive summary, which is supposed to be short, is like 20 pages. We have a lot to say here at Glisten Research. Um, so, uh, and we will give you some of the key findings, but we encourage you to go to glisten.org slash NSES to look at the uh, full report. And then we have executive summaries of it in English and in Spanish. And we'll have some conclusions or recommendations followed by a Q&A, so don't forget, put in your questions in the Q&A box. Um, you can follow us on Twitter. We hope you do. Uh, we love the Twitter at Glisten Research. Um, and you can join the conversation if you want and you Twitter, uh, uh, if you tweet and use hashtag NSCS2021. So this is not terribly readable. I do not expect anyone to read this. So uh, not that anyone would, but uh, I do just want to acknowledge because this is the 12th uh, instance of Glisten releasing this biennial report. And as I said, they, we have a legacy of many researchers who've worked on these over time. Um, and, and I just wanted, and often this is in the report, but people may not see this. We need to thank the youth who participate in our study. We've had over uh, 20,000 students this year take it, but over 100,000 students in the time in all the surveys that we have done since 1999. Um, and we're really grateful to everyone who helped disseminate information about it, teachers, school district officials, our chapter leaders, volunteers, and our, and our BFFs and partners at other local service organizations and local LGBTQ youth organizations across the country. Um, we are nothing without all of you. So we really appreciate it. And to parents and educators who got the word out as well. And, uh, and to our chapters and local volunteers. And um, we've had a dozen or more staff who've been involved in school climate over time. Every report sort of builds on reports of the past. So I won't read off everyone's names, but I, I just want to acknowledge all the people who have done this. In particular, staff, uh, Adrian Zangrone, I will mention too, Adrian Zangrone and Yan Chong um, were involved in the early phases around data collection, but also around data cleaning. Uh, and Adrian in particular did a Herculean job in adapting our survey for um, the different kinds of learning environments students were in in the 2020-21 school year.
So a little bit about the background on the survey itself. So uh, we first conducted it in 1999, and at the time there was no national research on LGBTQ plus students. There was very little research on LGBTQ plus adolescents. It would at that time would have been more LGB or LGB, not so much even T, but, um, and there was very little and most of it was focused on risk behaviors and it wasn't national in scope. And Gleason often encountered in its early years of advocacy, uh, people saying, well, is this really a problem? Like, you know, our school's good or our schools in New York are good, go to New Jersey. Um, so there was a lot of people and there wasn't, even though often we would have students who would give first person testimony to what they were experiencing that could often be seen as, well, that's just one person who had a problem in school. So it was important for us to document, we didn't have data showing what is going on for LGBTQ plus students across the country. And that gave birth to the idea of this national survey that started in 1999, which was a simpler, smaller survey. Uh, the survey mm, was, has been more consistent since 2001 when actual researchers were here. And of course, researchers make things longer. And so it's longer and more in depth. Um, so, and it, there's still a continued need to do this to further the national conversation about LG, LGBTQ plus issues in schools. Um, even though there is more national data out there on the experiences of LGBTQ uh, youth, we really um, focus on education. So we really drill down and have a lot of information about what is it like in schools, not just in terms of sort of bullying and harassment, name calling, but um, also what kinds of supports are there in school? Because it's important we work very hard, school advocates across the country are working very hard to make sure that schools have resources that make um, schools safe and affirming for LGBTQ plus students and all students. And we, it's important for us to track that as well over time. Um, we also look at what are um, the negative effects of, of a negative school climate. We look at how does that relate to students' well-being and academic performance. Uh, and with regard to supports, we, we also look to see how those make a difference in, in creating uh, better school experiences for the student themselves and their well-being as well as their academic performance. And um, obviously this data is for the world and for the people and we hope that people use it in their local areas to advocate for the needs of the students in their schools um, and, and also for policymakers at the state, the federal state and also um, school district level. Um, and we really are continuing uh, uh, still only the national research focused on LGBT youth and schools and about education. And so here is the family of national school climate uh, reports over time. You can see the one on the top was like three pages. Um, again, as I said, a researcher was uh, not as involved in that. And then uh, they've been very similar since 2001 and 2003. And, I uh, would like to welcome the new addition to the family, which is the 2021 National School Climate Survey. Uh, so as in the past, this survey examines, as I said, indicators of hostile school climate, what those effects are, access to supports and the benefits of having those supports. And because we've been doing this for so long, um, we can look at changes over time. Um, so we can see what is improving, what is not improving, where does more work need to happen. And because LGBTQ plus are, youth are, are not a monolith, we look at demographic differences uh, within the sample. Um, and as well as, and schools are not all the same all across the country. So we also look at school characteristics and if there are differences in school climate with regard to that. Um, because um, this is, uh, so this is uh, based on the experiences in 2020, 2021. And as you may recall, that was the full school year after the COVID pandemic broke. So um, the year prior, by and large, schools uh, went not in person uh, in, around March or April. But come when school started again in September, uh, schools adapted in very different ways. And it really varied, as we'll talk about by um, some characteristics of where you were in the country. But um, so we had, so we look at differences in cross learning environments. I think I say more about. So, and how we adapted the survey was um, we had students who were in online only schools. So issues of in-person assault and harassment were not necessarily applicable. Um, so we asked more detailed questions for those youth who were in uh, uh, online settings, whether they were in them all the time or only part of the time or on bias-based harassment uh, online in the school setting, like during the school day when you're online. 
Um, and, and how did they report that? Because, uh, you know, back in the day when students were in school, they may or may not have understood what are the procedures for reporting these things. You would go and tell a teacher, you'd go to the principal. How did that work for them when they were uh, in an online environment? And uh, as I said, we look at differences across the three types of learning environments, and we talk about them when they are relevant and when they come up in the, in the report. We'll talk about them more specifically here. And just a note on language, we will refer to them as online only. So students who were for the entire school year in an online classroom, in-person only, students who were in person in school or should have been for the entire year. And then hybrid is what we call those who were, which is the uh, largest number of students, people who were in some combination of online and in-person learning. Uh, we uh, let the world know about our survey. It's an online survey and we do outreach to constituents and national, regional, and local organizations and groups. Uh, to let them know about it and also our chapters and who we'll work a lot with, with groups of youth. Um, but to get the broadest sample possible, we, we use social media uh, outreach. So advertising on Instagram and Facebook, and I believe we, uh, we toyed a little bit with TikTok um, and Snapchat. So uh, we tried to sort of really spread the word as much as we could uh, to people who were interested or connected to LGBTQ community issues, youth who were in school. Uh, and that was how we tried to get the broadest sample possible. Um, so we had over 22,000 LGBTQ plus students in the survey uh, in, the, in this installation. And they were from all 50 states, as well as DC and most of the uh, territories, US territories, Guam, Puerto Rico, US Virgin Islands and Northern Mariana Islands. Two thirds of the sample was white uh, and about a third were a youth of color. Uh, and of that group, more, uh, more often Latinx, identified as Latinx. Um, and with regard to sexual orientation, a little less than a third identified as bisexual, a little more than a quarter identified as lesbian or gay, and about a fifth identified as pansexual. And with regard to gender, about a third were uh, cisgender, a little less than a third identified as non-binary and a, about a quarter identified as transgender. And the average age um, in the survey this year was 15.4 years. And predominantly students were most likely to be in ninth and 10th grade, uh, 10th and 11th grade. Um, with regard to the types of schools the youth were in, um, as I mentioned, uh, most students were in some hybrid learning environment, 63.4%, like almost two thirds were in a hybrid so they were in online and in-person learning. A quarter were in online learning and the minority of students said that they were in-person only. So the interesting to note in this table is really interesting to dig into. So you should get the report and try to like dig into the, see where the differences are. But largely um, it is interesting to see where, what types of schools were more likely to be in-person only. Um, and those were private schools schools in the South and Midwest and rural schools. Um, so those schools, those areas were more likely to have students who were in in-person classes for the entire school year. And now move on to some of our findings. Uh, first, we asked students around uh, safety and how they feel uh, in school, uh, whether they feel safe in school and about four in five LGBTQ students said that they felt unsafe at school because of some personal characteristics. So this chart, um, the top line uh, is uh, the total number. They felt un unsafe uh, for some reason. Um, and then uh, the bars below sort of drill down into the reasons why. And uh, it, uh, the most commonly because of some uh, sexual orientation, gender identity or gender expression characteristics. So for an LGBTQ identities, if you could go back. Oh, well, yeah, go back. Sorry, Katie. <laughs> um, and uh, and uh, followed by uh, mental health or emotional disability was also quite common. And then uh, following behind that was body size or weight. Were the, the, so those are the, the key reasons why LGBTQ plus youth are not feeling safe in schools. And now the next slide. Um, so of those who felt unsafe because of one or more SOGI characteristics, um, uh, the, about half said it was because uh, they felt unsafe related to their sexual orientation 
um, and le a little less than half, so because of their gender expression, their gender identity. We also ask students if there are places in school that they avoided. Uh, so sometimes students cope um, with unsafe spaces in school by not going to all the places in their, their school, not really having access, uh, sort of psychological access to all of the, the places in school as a protective measure. Um, and so for those who were in hybrid or in-person learning environments, so meaning those who were like in a school building uh, during that school year, uh, the, we asked them that, uh, what spaces did they avoid? And most commonly students said bathrooms and locker rooms and PE um, or gym class. So spaces that were often gendered, uh, restricted by gender. Yeah, um, and, and in general, historically, locker rooms and, and phys ed classes and gym class and sports teams have been locations where students have often said that they feel unsafe. So that, that is consistent with that. Um, students also sometimes unfortunately cope from having an unsafe learning environment by not going to school. So, and a third said that they had missed at least one day of school in the past month because they felt unsafe. Uh, and even more serious than that, there are some students who no longer can attend the school that they go to because the, it is an untenable situation. So they may miss classes, but then for some, it's impossible they, for them to continue to be and thrive and exist and survive in, in a school environment, in a particular school. And um, about 16% said that they had changed schools at some point um, in their time because they felt unsafe. Uh, we also ask students about biased language in school. So this is hearing negative remarks in the halls or from people or in the chat, if you're in an online classroom, um, not necessarily directed at one person, but hearing those in the environment, hearing them you know, being said out loud still contributes to an unwelcoming environment. And the majority of LGBTQ students regularly are heard, so that's often or frequently homophobic remarks and negative remarks about gender expression. So I just will walk you briefly through this chart. You can see it's sort of staggered, but the bars on the right are the, those who said often or frequently. So looking at those lighter bars, the striped violet bar and the uh, polka dotted bar, um, though uh, you can see that it was more common, people more often, more frequently said that they were hearing uh, the remarks like, that's so gay. If you don't know that remark, by it seems like people, everyone knows that expression now, but it's saying gay when you mean something is dumb or bad, um, like that class was so gay. Um, uh, and hearing no homo, um, which is an expression like if you were to say, I like your shirt, and then you say no homo, meaning this I'm not coming on to you. This is not a you know a, a gay encounter. I just was saying I like your shirt, um, and uh, and then followed by uh, remarks about gender expression. Uh, those would be the most common, and then other kinds of homophobic remarks. And only about a third, a little more than a third, said that they often or frequently hear negative remarks about transgender people. Um, Unfortunately, uh, although less, less common than hearing these kinds of remarks from uh, their peers, uh, the majority of LGBTQ plus students have heard anti-LGBTQ language from school staff. And that's what this chart shows. Um, you can see that over half said that they had heard uh, um, negative rem homophobic remarks. Um, and more than half said that they heard negative remarks about gender expression from their teachers. Um, and unfortunately, most of the, the, the largest answer for both of them was rarely, but rarely is not never. So it's like, we, we would hope this chart to be 100% of the dark blue bottom bar, you know, with that, uh, of people saying never. Um, in the report, there's a whole section looking at our data over time, but since we're talking about homophobic remarks, uh, and transphobic remarks, I, we can, this chart will just show you sort of the trends over time since 2001. And uh, you can see that there had been previously in early history, a decline in a lot of um, homophobic remarks. 
uh, but actually not so much recently. And from 2019 to 2021, uh, homophobic remarks, trans remarks, uh, negative trans remarks, and use of that's so gay and no homo were about the same levels that they were in 2019. So the good news is they did not um, necessarily get worse, but we do not see the continued downward trend that we had in previous years. Unfortunately, negative remarks about gender expression increased from 2019 to 2021. That would be the sort of light blue bar with X's uh, on the bottom. So it is less common of these, but it is uh, unfortunately the one that has increased in the last since our last survey. Um, we also, uh, oh yeah, we also uh, tracked, uh, looked at, uh, is there has um, the frequency of hearing anti-LGBTQ plus language from um, teachers at school and teachers and school staff in increased over time. And you can see the lines overall, not so different over the years, but it is notable to say that from 2019 to 2021, both kinds of remarks, both homophobic remarks and negative remarks about gender expression have increased um, as being heard by teachers. So as more students are saying that they're hearing these remarks from their teachers and school staff. Um, and the, the, one of the issue, of course, a huge issue with a student, with teachers making these remarks is, is that it, they are role models. So if they're using this kind of language, it's, it's sort of giving license to students that it's okay. The other way that unfortunately teachers can also sort of give implicit permission um, that this language is all right, as if they don't intervene. So when these remarks are made in their presence, then they don't, um, then they're essentially giving a message that it's okay, you can say these things in school. And so we asked students if they were, how often um, they reported, uh, how much, how often teachers or school staff intervened when homophobic and, um, remarks were made. And as you can see from this chart on the left, that, um, half or more than half said, a uh, half said never, and uh, more than half said that students don't intervene either. We would not necessarily expect it to be the job of students um, to, to ensure that happens, meaning to intervene. However, it's, you know, ally behavior is important, and so, and bystander behavior is important. So um, half of the students are not also intervening when these things are happening in their presence. Uh, with regard, and the numbers are very similar uh, to um, to uh, intervention with regard to gender expression. Um, almost 60% said that staff never intervene. And a, a slightly uh, a fewer students said that uh, students don't intervene around gender remarks when compared to homophobic remarks. So it was less than half, or it was more than half for intervention on homophobic remarks. So that gives us some. Um, uh, hmm positive feelings for the future. So there's more intervention by students with on gender uh, biased remarks. Uh, we also discussed in the report other kinds of uh, negative language that students hear, um, sexist remarks, remarks about ability, body size and weight, racist remarks, uh, remarks about religion and immigration status. Um, and so this chart shows that it's most common, very common for students to hear sexist remarks in school and remarks about a, uh, a student's ability um, and remarks about body size and weight followed by racist remarks. Comments about religion and immigration status were uh, less frequent. Uh, and with regard to a harassment or assault, so as I said, this, these, now we're gonna talk about incident students experience where they are the target of that behavior. Uh, as opposed to just hearing something or something going on in the school and the ether of the school behind them. And we asked students about their experiences with verbal harassment, um, physical harassment. So verbal harassment would be your, call, your called names, your uh, negative remarks are being made at you, about you. Physical harassment, which is being pushed or shoved um, and physical assault, which are more uh, egregious and serious things sort of being kicked um, punched, injured with a weapon. Um, and so over all these forms of harassment and assault, over four and five LGBTQ plus youth who were in person. So we asked these questions of those students who were in person learning environments. So those who were 
only in person during the year and those who were in mixed hybrid and hybrid learning environments where they were online and in person. Um, and over four out of five students said that they experienced some form of victimization um, with regard to their sexual orientation, gender, or gender expression. Uh, specifically, uh, harassment and assault, again, in person, uh, based on sexual orientation, six in 10 students said that they were verbally harassed, about a quarter said they were physically harassed, and about almost one in 10 said that they had been physically assaulted. So although one in 10 is small, and this is less than one in 10, we're talking very serious events. So one in 10 students are experiencing um, being punched or kicked, physically abused, or even injured with a weapon in school. So in the severity of that event, that's a pretty uh, shocking number. Uh, similarly, with uh, victimization based on gender expression, over half had been verbally harassed, about one in five had been physically harassed, and a, almost one, a similar number, about one in 10 said that they had been physically assaulted at school because of their gender expression. And with regard to gender, um, over half had been verbally harassed, uh, more than one in five had been physically harassed, and again, almost one in 10 were uh, physically assaulted. Uh, we also, uh, as I said, that was for students who were in person at some point during the school year. So one of the ways that we adapted the survey was asked about biased events, biased um, harassment in school, in school, in the online classroom and in the online school environment. And that's what the chart on the left shows um, around sexual orientation, gender, and gender expression. Overall, considering all of this, half of the LGBTQ plus students who attended school online during the school year experienced some form of online identity-based harassment. Uh, and it was about a third or more, uh, well, around a third uh, for sexual orientation, um, gender, and gender expression. So. Um, and, and so again, these are students who were in uh, hybrid learning environments, meaning combo online and in-person and who are online only. So, at, and this is a tough chart, it's in our executive summary. Uh, it shows the, all the forms of these three forms, uh, uh, verbal harassment, physical harassment, physical assault, um, by sexual orientation, gender expression, and gender over time. And so, but the takeaway really is that we had seen, especially with verbal harassment, um, with regard to um, sexual orientation and gender expression in particular, we have seen um, great improvements since we first started doing this, uh, um, this research. And now good enough, I, I mean, obviously, uh, not the, the, there is more room to grow. And in the recent years, all of these things from 2019 to 2021, they kind of have leveled off. The verbal harassment regarding sexual orientation is leveled off. Um, verbal harassment regarding gender expression didn't differ from 2019, but it was lower than 2017 in some previous years. So uh, that is some good news. And physical assault and physical harassment mostly were similar from 2019 to 2021 for all three um, forms, sexual orientation, gender expression, and gender identity. And so you can see those harassment and assault are lower. We've seen less change. We've seen some change over the years, but very little change in recent years. Um, in addition to asking about SOGI related, so sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and in addition to asking about SOGI related events, we do ask about if students are bullied or harassed for other reasons like race, ethnicity, bullied or harassed um, for other reasons and about race, ethnicity, uh, disability, religion, about a quarter said that they had been um, uh, victimized at school because of their race, ethnicity, a third because of a disability and, um, and, and it looks like about a fifth was religion, although that bar should be not as tall as it is, um, but religion was typically less common. Um, we also ask about other forms of harassment that students experience, so social exclusion, uh, often called relational aggression. So um, being, uh, so something that's informal, but sort of using the peer group to sort of exclude or ice out people. So social exclusion, uh, having room, negative rumors spread about you, uh, 
those are two forms of relational aggression. And um, you can see social exclusion is quite common, um, where over 80% said they experienced it at some point in the past year. And 60% said that they had had negative rumors, mean lies or rumors spread about them. And I also asked about sexual harassment and a nearly six in 10 students said that they experienced sexual harassment in the past year. And for those who were in school, uh, in a school building at some point during the year, we asked about property damage uh, and that was less common, but about four in 10 students said that they had had some experience of um, having property damage um, feeling like they were being targeted because of who they were. And now I'll pass it on to Katie to talk about reporting. Thanks, Joe. Um, and before I really get into it, I'm just going to give a preemptive apologies to anyone if um, there is noise in the background. They have a 16-month-old a couple of rooms over, and he's been quite grumpy today. Um, so Joe talked about, just talked about um, incidents of harassment and assault. And in addition to asking students about their experiences with being victimized, we also asked um, about their reporting of that victimization to staff and how staff are responding. And so the majority of students, 61.5%, never reported incidents of harassment or assault to their school staff. You can see that in the bar with the pink circle around. Um, that's the, the, the percentage of students who are saying that, yes, I'm being harassed or assaulted in school, but I'm not telling anybody about it. Um, and the bar on the right is um, if they're reporting to their parents. So somewhat similar rates of not reporting harassment or assault. We looked at the differences in learning environment between students who are online and, and um, in school, and we did find some differences in students who attended school online at any point in the year were less likely to report harassment and assault to staff um, compared to students who went to um, school in person or in person only. In addition to asking if they reported, we asked them um, if they didn't, why not? And so the most common reason that students said for that they is the reason they didn't report harassment and assault to school staff is because they doubted effective interve intervention would occur. So over two and three students didn't think school staff would do anything if they reported their harassment. Um, and nearly three and five didn't did thought that if staff did do something that it wouldn't be effective. And in fact, we asked students who did report um, harassment and assault, we asked them what the response was from staff. And we found that among these students, the most common staff response was that they did nothing or they told the reporting student to ignore the harassment and assault. Um, so that's about 60% 60, 60 of students said that they were told that staff did nothing or they were told to ignore it. 40.8% um, of students said they were told to ignore it. 45.4% were told that was reported that staff took no action uh, when they, after they had reported. We asked students also, um, when you report how effective, well, we discussed this, how effective it is. You can see in this bar graph that the majority of students said it was not at all effective. Whatever approach staff took after they were, they reported victimization to staff that it wasn't, it wasn't at all effective. And then the um, slice that is the purple with the dots is somewhat ineffective. So it's a large percentage of students saying that when they are reporting, the response from staff is not effective. Um, we found students said that their, that staff response was perceived by students to be more effective when staff took disciplinary action against the perpetrator or the person who did the harassment assault, when staff educated that person about bullying, um, when parents, uh, the perpetrator's parents were contacted by staff, um, and when emotional support was provided to the reporting student, the, the student who was victimized um, by staff, not victimized by staff, but provided emotional support by staff. And when we look at reporting of victimization over time, we find that the frequency of reporting harassment assault didn't differ from 2017 to 2019 to 2021. Um, and there also was no change in perceived effectiveness of staff responses. So similar rates of pretty much um, most students saying that it was not effective. 
So we discussed bias language um, and harassment and assault. So things that are happening by other students, by individuals in, in school settings. We also ask students about discriminatory policies and practices that they're experiencing in their schools. Um, and we asked students whether they experienced any of several different kinds of policies or practices that are discriminatory and related to their LGBTQ identity. And the majority of LGBTQ plus students, 58.9%, reported that they had experienced some kind of anti-LGBTQ discriminatory policy and practice, um, which you can see in that dark blue bar at the top. Here are all of the different, this, I know this is a large and hard to read graph, um, so I will just zoom in on the most common forms of discrimination or discriminatory policies and practices that students reported experiencing. And those include being prevented from using one's chosen name or pronouns, prevented from using the bathroom um, or locker room that align with their gender, and being disciplined for public displays of affection that would not be disciplined or that are not disciplined for if um, the couple engaging in them is not LGBTQ or doesn't involve LGBTQ students. Um, LGBTQ students, when we looked at learning environment differences, LGBTQ plus students who had been in in-person learning environments during the 2020, 2020 year were far, far more likely to experience any form of, of these, these types of LGBTQ related um, discriminatory policies and practices. And overall, when we look at it over time, the percentage of students experiencing discrimination increased in 2021 from 2020 19. Um, though it wasn't different from the rates of discrimination experienced by students from 2013 to 2017. So 2000, 2013 to 2017 remained pretty consistent. Um, it decreased in 2019, but then we saw it rise up again in 2021. And so all of these incidents, these statistics about bias language, harassment, assault, discrimination, all of this contributes to a hostile school climate for LGBTQ youth. Um, and we also look at what the effects of this hostile school climate are on students, on their well-being, on their school experiences. And we, found, we find that just victimization and discrimination were both associated with poor academic outcomes. So students that experience more victimization and more discrimination um, have lower GPAs, lower levels of school belonging or connectedness to school, lower educational aspirations or planning to go on to school be beyond high school, um, and more absences. For example, you can see here in this graph, um, students who experienced discrimination uh, were almost three times as likely to skip school <coughs> because they felt unsafe. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, victimization and discrimination were both associated with poor psychological well being, also, and that was measured by depression and self esteem. So, students who had higher levels of victimization and discrimination experienced higher levels of depression, lower levels of self esteem. Um, and you can see here in this graph, um, the bars with the purple and the dots are students who experienced higher victimization compared to the uh, dark blue students who experienced lower victimization. And you can see that they were associated with uh, greater levels of depression. Victimization and discrimination were also both associated with more disciplinary action. Um, so students who were experienced more victimization and more discriminatory policies and practices also experienced more discipline at school, such as um, receiving detention, um, in school suspension, out of school suspension, expulsion, et cetera. And so now knowing that, knowing that students face a hostile school climate, um, that this hostile school climate has a negative effect on their mental health and their school experiences and school outcomes, um, we look at if how to alleviate those, those negative effects of hostile school climate. And we look at school resources and supports that can help improve school experiences and school climate for LGBTQ youth. And we look at supportive educators, student clubs like Gay Straight Alliances or Gender Sexuality Alliances, 
LGBTQ inclusive curricular resources um, and LGBTQ inclusive policies. And we find that having these resources is related to fewer negative school, negative school experiences. So hearing fewer homophobic remarks, um, feeling less unsafe at school, fewer experiences of victimization, improved schools, um, increased staff, school staff intervening in biased language and more positive educational outcomes. So missing less day, fewer days of school, having greater educational aspirations and higher GPA. <coughs> Unfortunately, though, when we look at the availability of these resources to LGBTQ students, we find that most of them don't have access to these resources and supports that we know create safer and more LGBTQ affirming school environments. So in regards to supportive educators, um, we do find that almost all students said that they had access to at least one uh, school staff member who was supportive of LGBTQ people. And 58.2% could identify six or more supportive staff. In regards to GSAs, we found that 34.8% of students said that they had a GSA at their school. 16.3% of students said that they were taught some positive representation of LGBTQ people, history, or issues in their school or in their classes. Um, and we asked in general about there's about if they were taught LGBTQ content in their classes, and we specifically asked what kinds of classes that um, content is included in, which you can find in the full report. But we also ask about um, LGBTQ inclusive sex education. And you can see in the pie chart here, students who say that they don't experience uh, that blue chunk is students say they don't experience educate or they don't receive edu sex education at all. Um, and then a breakdown of if that sex education is inclusive of LGB topics, if it's inclusive of trans and non-binary topics, and if it's inclusive of both, or if it's just sex education without any of it. And we find that only 7.4% of LGBTQ students were taught sex ed that included positive inclusion of LGB and trans and non-binary topics. And finally, when it comes to inclusive policies, we find that 12% had an anti-bullying po policy that included, um, explicitly included sexual orientation and gender identity and expression. And only 8.2% of students had official policies or guidelines that supported trans and non-binary students. <coughs> These are things like um, athletics, uh, trans affirming athletics policies or policies around changing um, names and official documents and using names and pronouns. And when we look at school resources and supports over time, we found that in 2021, access to GSAs fell to under 40%. Um, you can see the GSAs are the, the peach circle um, and they dropped quite a bit between 2019 and 2021. Supportive staff, access to LGBTQ supportive educators was also lower this year than in recent years. And we also saw fewer students, lower reports of anti-bullying harassment policies that were inclusive of LGBTQ people. Um, and regarding LGBTQ inclusive curriculum, which has consistently been one of the lowest reported resources, we um, didn't see this decrease, but we did we also didn't see many positive, much positive change in this. So when we look at school resources, access to these supportive resources um, and learning environment, we found that LGBTQ plus students who attended school in person only were less likely to say that their school had a GSA or that they had access to a GSA than those who attended school online only or in a hybrid setting. Students who attended school online, either hybrid or only online, were more likely to report LGBTQ inclusive curriculum um, in their classes. Students who attended school online were more likely to report receiving any kind of sex education, which does include including LGBTQ plus inclusive sex ed. 
students who were in online only school reported the highest and students in in-person only school reported the lowest numbers of supportive educators. And students who had been in school in person were less likely to report having comprehensive anti-bullying policy. That is an anti-bullying policy that explicitly mentions sexual orientation and gender identity, as well as being less likely to report having um, policies or guidelines that were affirming for trans and non-binary students. And I am going to um, throw it to Leash to talk about personal demographics and school characteristics. Thanks, Katie. Um, so as Joe mentioned earlier, LGBTQ students are not a monolith. Um, and because of that, we look at differences by personal demographics as well as school characteristics in our survey. Um, when we look at differences by sexual orientation, we found in general that pansexual students reported more hostile experiences. You can see that by looking at the figure. The figure is a little long, confusing. So if you look on the left, um, those are different sexual orientation groups. For each of these groups, we looked at victimization by sexual orientation, which is represented by the blue circle, um, victimization based on gender expression, which is represented by the purple square, and victimization based on gender, which is represented by the red triangle. So as you can see from the figure, pansexual students experienced higher levels of victimization based on sexual orientation, based on gender identity, and based on gender than students of many other sexual orientations. Um, we also found that pansexual students experienced more sexual harassment, more discriminate, discriminatory policies and practices, um, as well as missing more days of school because of feeling unsafe and changing schools more often um, than peers of many other sexual orientations. When we um, consider differences by gender, we also found there are key differences. If you look at the figure, um, there are umbrella categories such as cisgender, transgender, non-binary and question, questioning, which is seen on the left in the bold. Um, and it's marked by larger shapes as well as we also have um, by more specific categories such as cisgender girls, cisgender boys, trans girls, trans boys, non-binary trans people, et cetera. Um, and those are represented by the smaller shapes under those bigger umbrella terms. Overall, we found that transgender and non-binary students reported more hostile experiences when compared to their cisgender peers. So for example, they faced more anti-LGBTQ victimization and they were more likely to feel unsafe at school. We found that transgender and non-binary students have less access to education than their peers, not only because they feel more unsafe and experience more victimization, but also because they have restricted access within the school environment, <clears throat> um, specifically because there's a lack of access to sex segregated spaces. Um, looking at the differences between trans and non-binary students, we found that trans students reported more hostile experiences than non-binary students in general. And then when we look specifically at cisgender LGBTQ students, we found that cisgender male students encountered more hostile school climates regarding their gender expression and sexual orientation. Whereas when we look at cisgender females, um, they encountered more hostile school climates with regard to their gender. Um, we also considered differences by race and ethnicity. Overall, we found that, oh, can you see the figure, Katie, on the back? No. Oh, I can see it on mine. That's so strange. Sorry. Um, so you just have to oh, imagine it. Describe imagine. it, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's a similar figure to the ones we've seen before with the races on the left and um, the different kinds of experiences of victimization being represented by um, different shapes. <clears throat> um, overall, what we found was that Native and Indigenous LGBTQ students experienced more hostile school climates than their peers of other racial and ethnic groups in many areas. Um, specifically, Native and Indigenous students experienced higher rates of victimization based on both gender orientation, sexual, I mean, sexual orientation, gender expression, gender, and race and ethnicity than um, students of almost all other races and ethnicities. <clears throat> Um, Native and Indigenous students also reported poorer outcomes when considering their feelings about education. Um, for example, they reported the lowest levels of school belonging. Um, and additionally, we found that LGBTQ students of color 
um, including Black, AAPI, Latinx, Native and Indigenous, MENA, and multiracial students, um, more commonly experienced both racist and anti-LGBT victimization, and they were more likely to experience multiple forms of victimization in general um, than their white counterparts. When we um, look at safe learning environments and access to LGBT resources and supports, we often found that um, school level type and geographical differences um, were occurring. For example, by and large, the majority of LGBTQ students in middle schools and LGBT students from schools in rural areas um, experienced more hostile school climates and had less access to LGBTQ related resources and supports. We also found that LGBTQ students in schools in the South, followed by the Midwest, reported the most hostile school ex experiences. And we found that LGBTQ students in the South um, were the least likely to report having access to LGBTQ resources and supports. Um, we also examined differences by school type. We found that students in public schools were more likely to have GSAs when compared to both non-religious and religious private schools. Within public schools, um, we found that while students in charter and regular public schools reported similar experiences of hostile school climates, um, there were still some key differences. For example, charter schools were more likely to have access to inclusive curricular resources, as well as um, specific policies that support trans and non-binary students. Um, and they were also more likely to have supportive admin. Um, regular public schools were more likely to have to have students that reported having access to LGBTQ library resources. A possible reason for this could be that charter schools are sometimes situated within uh, regular public schools and they may not have control over their library uh, resources. In general, we also found that private non-religious schools were more positive school environments for LGBTQ um, youth than public and private religious schools. Um, they had a greater access to most resources. <clears throat> and when we look specifically at religious private schools, compared to non-religious private schools, we found that private school students um, reported less victimization based on sexual orientation and gender than those in public schools. And they experienced the greatest, however, they experienced the greatest level of discrimination and um, the lowest access to resources. Um, these lower levels of victimization, <clears throat> maybe that we see in private schools, maybe due to the fact that private schools can easily expel students who bully, um, which is not always the case in public schools, which could result in comparatively lower rates of harassment and victimization. Um, however, for example, with private religious schools, the policies and practices that they have may reflect a more negative experience overall, which could result in greater LGBTQ discrimination and fewer supports. I just want to add that most, uh, just so people understand, the most of the religious schools in the United States, as most of the students in religious schools in our sample, were from Catholic schools. So, if any of you are familiar with some um, sort of um, classic characteristics, you know, they they may have more discipline, they may have more structure and order, uh, and so that also might contribute to that. I just wanted everybody to know that it was most students in religious schools; they're actually Catholic schools. Thank you for that clarification. Um, so in conclusion, schools remain um, hostile for LGBTQ students. Um, our 2021 National Schools Climate Survey continues to provide evidence for that. Um, and it highlights that there's a lot of work that needs to be done to um, ensure that schools are safe and affirming spaces. Um, we found the majority of all students reported these hostile school environments. Um, however, there were key differences among groups um, specifically trans and non-binary youth and youth of color, as well as youth of other multiple marginalized identities, um, they face some of the most hostile school climates. <clears throat> we found that the type of learning environment that our students had greatly impacted their school experiences. More specifically, the more time that a student spent in an online versus in-person learning environment was related to the degree of victimization that they experienced. So more specifically, LGBTQ students who were in in-person only um, were far more likely to experience um, any form of LGBTQ related discrimination than those who were in other types of learning environments. 
when we think about hybrid students, um, they experienced a lower frequency of both victimizations. However, they were exposed to both online and in-person victimization um, compared to their peers who were only in person or only online, who only experienced one form. Um, when we look over time, we found that LGB LGBTQ students were less likely to report having nearly all LGBTQ resources and supports compared to our last survey. Um, this is um, concerning overall. Um, in 2019, we hypothesized that the effects of positive changes in LGBTQ school supports um, that we see in one year would be then reflected in subsequent years as decreased levels of negative indicators of school climate. Unfortunately, we did not find that. Um, this could perhaps be because of school environment changes because of COVID, um, but overall we did not see the expected decreases in anti-LGBTQ incidents, um, although we didn't see them rise either. Um, but it is of grave concern that we saw such a significant decline in the supports with um, no respect to no decl um, decline of anti-LGBTQ incidences. Um, and this um, could potentially be worrisome for the school years that are to come. Um, but overall, our findings show that there is more work that needs to be done to make schools safer and affirming for LGBTQ students, specifically with establishing more positive supports in schools. So with those findings in mind, um, we have a couple of recommendations. So overall, um, it's uh, clear that there's more work to be done and that we need to establish more positive supports in schools. Um, moving forward, there are some key steps that concerned stakeholders can take on behalf of LGBTQ students. And those include um, supporting student clubs, such as GSAs, <clears throat> um, increasing supportive educators available to students through providing staff trainings, um, as well as increasing the amount of accurate and appropriate information regarding LGBTQ people, histories, and events. Um, we also recommend that schools examine their policies and practices uh, to ensure that they do not discriminate against LGBTQ students. Also regarding policies and practices, uh, we recommend that schools enact and implement, and implement specific policies and practices that are affirming for trans and non-binary students. Um, Finally, the adoption and implementation of anti-bullying policies is necessary. These policies should specifically enumerate sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender as protected categories. That is it. I see we have Great. some questions. So Katie and Nishi can turn, we can become visible again if you choose to. Um, uh, so, um, uh, first, uh, many of you asked, so, well, thank you for some of the love that people shared in the, in the, in the questions. So we love that. And, um, I think some of these were answered already, but yes, the PowerPoint, I think we'll say this at the end, but the, uh, PowerPoint, well, the webinar is being recorded and will be available at a later date when it becomes available to us, and then we get our comms people to put it up on the website. So I think that takes a couple of days. Um, and because y'all registered, uh, we will send an email out to let y'all know when the recording is available. So um, I don't believe we have historically had the PowerPoint slides there for people to use. I think that we're always like, oh, how are they gonna use it? They're gonna steal our slide, they're gonna change our words. Yeah. I, but we can, we'll, we'll take into consideration, but the, the webinar for sure will be, um, available so you can watch it over and over and over again when you're tired of Hallmark movies during the holiday season and or you can tell all your friends and family to take a look if they were not able to be here today. Um, and um, I think there's one question uh, that I see and please feel free write in furiously write in more questions. Um, did we notice a disparity in students' responses of the middle versus high school students with regard to their experiences of bullying and harassment? So I'll kick that over to 
I forget who did that. Katie, did Katie. you do that section? I did. Yes, <laughs> we did. So oh, um, overall, in general, middle school students report more hostile school ex experiences than students in high school. Um, and that's, you know, in, in biased language, victimization, uh, discrimination. Um, and oh, and someone wants to go through the slides with their GSA. Well, you can have like a GSA viewing party of our webinar. <laughs> I think it's an amazing idea. Um, so, I do know um, that another question that popped up a couple of times and I answered some of them throughout is when are state snapshots coming out? Um, and so, um, all folks on this webinar might not know it, but we will, um, we do make state snapshots where we break down data um, state by state. And if the state has enough respondents to that, we feel confident that everything is, you know, confidential and also statistically uh, powerful enough. Um, we will make a state snapshot for that state, which is like a one, a one page, two side um, yeah, yeah. printout uh, with some, of the major findings for that state. And those will be out um, early 2023. So expect those in January. And if you sign up for our um, GLSEN research newsletter, which you can do at glsen.org slash research, we will email you when those come out and you can get a heads up. And typically when they come out, we do, um, we have historically done a, a joint webinar with our policy department because our, we work closely with our, our folks in the public policy office. And, um, because they um, are great at uh, tips and tools and methods for advocating at the state level in particular, a state and local level, but state level since this is state level data. So we, I believe we'll have 42 states out of the 50 plus DC. We will not have DC, unfortunately. Um, so if you're from a smaller population state like Rhode Island, Hawaii, DC, um, <clears throat> you, you are probably unlikely to have a state snapshot. We're sorry, we we, we can only get so many. We had 20, 000, over 20,000 students in our survey. We would need like, you know, twice or double that to uh, for some of the smaller states. Um, and that'll be due. Um, there's a question. Do we uh, have any recommendation or guidance for school staff who are concerned about being targeted or retaliated against for supporting and affirming LGBTQ plus students and staff in places where there are anti-LGBTQ plus policies and laws? Anybody wanna take a step at that? So it's an, I, I'll say this, that I think it is, um, it, it, there are a couple things that it's tough, I think, in a teacher, especially in conservative areas with negative legislation, but, you know, there still is, um, because of um, the Supreme Court decision, there still is, uh, there is protection in employment, and then also, um, the government now believe, uh, has extended that to schools and education. So for public schools, there still is, and it's unclear what overrides the state law versus that, but there, there is still um, protections at the legal level. And for incidents in school, um, for bias incidents in school, and like inability to access education, that it's still important to contact the Office of Civil Rights at the Department of Education and file a complaint. And I think that's important to do. Um, in the past, the previous administration wasn't handling a lot of those uh, complaints, but that they are now. Uh, so we hear and we would hope. So those are still guidance. Um, and, you know, I think it, it's interesting at the school level, the one thing that I will say is that it, Administrators sometimes do care, uh, like school districts and like school boards, will sometimes care around issues with attendance and having you know students in seats because that relates to funding. So I think it is important if you ever wanted to use this data to talk about how we need to have supportive environments. One thing, money sometimes makes a difference, and it's about you have students, you have a segment of your student population who is not attending school, and not a, having students not attend relates to lower rosters, which relates to less funding. And so I think there's an economic cost to that. Um, and 
I don't know, Katie, do you have anything, Katie or Leash, anything else you want to add around sort of being in states with anti LGBTQ plus legislation? I, I don't. Okay. <laughs> I read it and I, I thought I, I mean, I was, I would suggest that people um, with questions about actual on the ground education and, and being in schools um, get in touch with our education program department because um, they might have, I imagine they have resources and more knowledge than we do. Um, I know the data. I don't know as much about the the day-to-day -day activity. And I think that there are probably some tools in our policy department that has that they have online in addressing sort of these issues, especially when it comes to advocating around policies. Um, and uh, and I think that they would also recommend, like I had said, around reporting things um, to the Office of Civil Rights, because that that level of access is sort of um, is a protected right. So if people aren't having access to their school, you know, that is um, that, that's an issue that they the government needs to take up. Um, and I think it's uh, and it is tough in states where you can't. Uh, in the where they don't say gay laws, um, it is also important. You know, we've had this in the past. You know, the 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 laws that recently appeared uh, are are not wholly new. We've had as many as nine states in the past, I think, who had what we call no promo homo laws, like law, laws that restrict your ability to talk about um, LGBTQ plus issues in education. Um, and I think that, uh, and we had found, in fact, that students who were in those states had negative school experiences. Um, but we would hear from educators in those states that it was important that there are ways in which you have to really know what the law and policy states, what you can and cannot do. And, and so, for example, I believe in Arizona, which I think has been repealed, but the law was specifically about HIV education. So the problem is, is that then people think, oh, no, I can't talk about this at all. Well, the law really only states that you can't talk about it in sex education. Um, it doesn't mean you can't talk about queer history or things like that. So, but again, I would say check our policy department's website and recommendations on. And if you have a local chapter in your area and you can go to the Glisten website to see if you have a local chapter, I would say speak with them and get on board with them and, and, and learn about the activities that they're doing um, to affect positive change. And no matter where you are in the country, but also in these states that are now um, are, are, are more troubling. Um, one thing that I will uh, say that it's a, I don't think anybody asked it here, but it is a question we got a lot um, from uh, journalists when this report came out. And it was sort of, why do we think things are so different? And why, especially with the supports, why are they not, um, why do we see such a decrease in reports and, and is it related to some of the negative legislation that has hap been happening across the country? So, um, and it's important to know that this is data from 2020, 2021. So at that school year, at the end of that, so in that school year, we had a change in presidential administration. The previous administration had rescinded a lot of uh, positive actions from the Department of Education um, that had happened under Obama that were supportive of LGBTQ plus students. So a lot of that had gone away during the previous administration. And then um, after uh, Biden took office, uh, the department, that was at the end of the school year, uh, so toward the end of the school year. So uh, the department, the, the federal government was sort of beginning to ramp up their efforts in terms of reinstating some of the protections that had already been there. Um, and, um, but what also started happening at the end of that school year was uh, that's when there were a lot of uh, states uh, proposing and discussing legislation that was around trans student access to facilities and um, around uh, uh, teaching of critical race theory. And then, and then it started in addition to critical race theory, some of them were starting to add on sort of teaching about an LGBTQ plus topics in the curriculum. And we saw that start at the end of the school year and continue unfortunately into the following school year last year. Um, and um, so at a, at, a, at a structural state level, 
we're not sure how much of that 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 would have affected change in particularly in resources. Um, but it's important to remember that that probably is reflecting, well, first of all, especially around trans legislation, that got into the ether and the public discourse. So then people were getting it, hearing, oh, this is an issue, oh, safety in school, this is a threat. And that could affect in particular educators' behaviors or not knowing what they could and could not do, especially with the debate around critical race theory or inclusion of LGBTQ topics. People may think then, oh, am I gonna get in trouble? And so they may be more restrictive even if necessary, there was no actual law that passed in a particular state. So I think that at that, that level, that could affect public discourse. And it might be why we saw uh, we saw mostly not a lot of change in negative indicators of school climate from 2019 to 2021, but we did see some with regard to gender. So, well, for teachers, both remarks about gender and remarks and homophobic remarks increased, but I believe remarks about gender expression increased even more. It was even a higher increase. Um, and, um, and, and, and teaching, in, you know, inclusive teaching has always been a challenge if you, you probably won't remember the chart that we showed you five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago, but um, it's one of the lowest, at least common things to happen. So it's always been an issue that more work needs to be done. And I think that that's, this is really perhaps uh, in some ways maybe stymied some efforts where there's been increases. Now, that being said, there are, I think, four states now that have uh, passed laws around positive inclusion on LGBTQ topics. Um, so we'll be interested in seeing, and we hope that we can look at our data and write a research brief that looks at, I think maybe specifically California, because they've had the longest uh, law around curriculum to see is have, are there increases in inclusive curriculum from students perspective compared to those uh, in states that did not have these. Um, There's a question about clarifying our use of gender and gender expression. Um, and I know we talked a bit in results about um, victimization based on sexual orientation, gender, and gender expression. Um, and those are terms that we had actually in the survey. So there was a question, are you including trans as gender and separating gender expression from gender? Um, but those are terms we used that youth answered themselves about. So we asked, we literally asked them, um, are you, do you experience this kind of harassment or assault based on your sexual orientation, based on your gender? based on your gender expression. So we are not, sep we weren't separating uh, what kind of harassment or assault it was based on what we knew about students' gender identity or sexual orientations. We were just asking them explicitly um, because the distinction between gender and gender expression is really important, right? Like you can't say that if someone has a, a gender expression that is not, you know, is it is non-conforming that they're trans? That that's that's wrong. Um, and 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 so you can't use gender expression as a proxy for gender. So appreciate that, and um, happy to clarify that for you. <clears throat> um, there's also a question about, um, and it's a good question, and I think there's important things to think of, think through with all we're seeing about online and in person, and. So the question is a concern that I a concern I have is that with so much bad news and the data about youth being safer in hybrid or online only schools, that continued efforts to erase LGBTQ folks from schools will have a policy out, send them all online. Are there better ways to frame that? Can we counter or put it together with youth who experienced good outcomes in person, um, had good supports in their schools? Um, and I think that is a really good question. And um, I also was asked about this yesterday by a journalist and who said, so you, is, it, is it safe to say that students who are LGBTQ students who are struggling should go to online school? Um, and I quickly tried to frame it as, well, I think what it's saying is that some elements of online school were providing, were pr provided protection to LGBTQ youth. And instead of making sure more LGBTQ youth go to online school, we should really be investigating what about online school was more protective to LGBTQ youth and what about online school allowed teachers to include more LGBTQ content in their teaching and, and be that supportive educator that else to LGBTQ youth. Um, what about online schools made GSAs more common? And what about online schools made students aware of their LGBTQ inclusive policies? 
Um, but I think educators and inclusive curriculum is an important thing to think about as, well, let's not think, how do we get more LGBTQ kids in, online? How do we make sure that those things that were allowed to happen to um, increase supportive resources and online, how do we make sure that that's also um, built into our in-person schools as more and more schools get back to normal and business is normal? How do we take those protective factors that we saw in this unique year in this unique situation um, and learn from that to make our in-person schools more supportive? of LGBTQ youth. Yeah, and, and I think I would... it's also, I will also say we found with schools some good things, but um, you know, CDC, Department of Adolescent and School Health found in their adolescent behaviors and experiences survey some, some troubling data about uh, um, COVID in general and how youth had poorer mental health and um, some hostile home experiences. So um, it's important to look at it all together, right? Like we did find some some benefits of online schooling and and positive things that happened in this weird disrupted COVID year. Um, but there's also all of these other contexts of youth la youth lives, and we don't find that same thing. Um, so a transition to total online school, um, not not the solution. <laughs> I, I would also add that. And I to be that we should be very explicit that and it's a good note. I don't know if we're explicit enough in the report. I think we are, but um, and I'm yeah. And so a lot of this we do go into more explanation in the report itself. But it's a good note for us to think about our messaging going forward. The um, this uh, we we say nothing about quality of education and ability to learn. So we're not talking about that. We're not talking, and I believe that there's evidence that shows in-person learning probably it might be better and students are coming back last year to school at a learning at a deficit because they weren't learning to the same degree online. And so I just want to be clear, we're talking about school safety. We're not talking about school, and which is important, and your connection to school, but we're not talking about like, are you learning? And so I think that that's, that's not what this report is about, but I think that's an important thing to state. Also, the we found that you know some of it is it would be true for all students it's like what i said around religious schools that might have more discipline in, in order or more structure so one of the things that i think is a factor contributing to sort of the issues of safety but also the availability of supports is um during this year of after during covid was um having um access to students. So being in an online classroom, students still experienced online victimization. They still experienced uh, identity-based uh, um, online harassment from their peers. But we're talking about environments where there's probably less open free space among students to just hang out and do things. They're not, there's not a lunchroom. They're not in the gym. There's, there's um, and chats might be more monitored or students feel more monitored. In our report, we talk about in general, and we've always found this, that students are more likely to say uh, anti-LGBTQ remarks happen when uh, teachers or school staff are not around. So, uh, and so the online classroom is probably, okay, school's over, you're gone. With some of the supports around in person, and we do discuss this more in the report, it, we believe some of it had to do with interpersonal restrictions based on COVID. So even schools that were in person, probably had social distancing, probably had restrictions on one-to-one -one interactions. So it's quite possible that, for example, students were less likely to say they found a supportive educator at school because they weren't having time to find and talk to them. They were like in class and then they were gone. And GSAs, they some schools didn't figure out how to, some schools weren't having extracurricular activities if they were in person. And online, not all schools figured out how to do extracurricular clubs in a virtual setting. And for some, it wasn't necessarily effective, perhaps. So those are all key factors that come into play. But most importantly, we're not talking about are they learning just as well, which I think is the, one of the major points of schooling is like we want them to learn. So um, we're really just talking yeah. about safety. And I think also it's important when even just talking about safety and the differences in online and in person and then um, 
if people that the danger of people taking that data, these findings and extrapolating to just in general, online learning is better than in-person learning. We're not even really like our findings aren't even just generally about online versus in-person schooling. Our findings are about online versus in-person schooling during a year where there was a global pandemic. Like the in-person, the kids who went to school in person also weren't in a school, um, ex weren't experiencing school in the way that students in the past 20 years of our research were experiencing, right? Like Joe mentioned, right. people were wearing masks, there was social distance, perhaps you couldn't pop into your teacher's classroom afterwards to talk to them about troubles that you were having, where if you were online, you maybe could have hung out on Zoom a little bit longer because of actual concerns about physical contact and, and virus transmission um, and things like extracurricular activities. So it's important also to know that like the in-person students weren't just in normal school, they were in a school building during a pandemic with that risk and, and everything that came in with that. And, and to add to that, if you think back earlier, I talked about where students were more likely to be in in-school learning only. And if you think about, and then Leish talked about what schools, like regional school characteristics made a different, where a very, how schools, uh, student experiences varied based on regional and school characteristics. And you may have noticed an overlap. So schools that were most likely to be online, in person only, um, we're often in the type of school or in the parts of the country where students already, regardless of what kind of school they're in, were having worse experiences in school. Um, so like in um, uh, the South, the South. And, Mid South and Midwest. Um, and, uh, and so, and, and even though we try to statistically account for that, um, I, I do wonder whether it's like, well, we can't really take it all out. So I think that that's important to point out. Um, so, but that's a, thank you for that um, note. And we will definitely think about that. I don't think any of us would say, oh yeah, you should go online. Like the students should go online. Although I will also say we've had some student leaders uh, who are with Glisten in the, that year that we would talk to. And some of them are like, online works better for the way I learn, but others are like, not, this is not working. So I think what COVID raised and online learning raised for education in general is really accommodating learning styles. So, in a so when it comes to sort of adequate and competent and good learning, not around school safety. But um, so I think it is a really good question that um, we'll have to think more about. But I don't think any of us in the research institute would say, yeah, online learning is the way to go. Um, I just want to run. We are at like five thirty, so I know we had just before everybody leaves um, some more links and information for you um, to share the school climate survey, um, glisten.org slash NSCS. You can find the full report. You can find the executive summaries in English and in Spanish. Um, this infographic on the right that you can find, download, share it on social medias. And as we said, tonight, state snapshots coming in January of 2023. Um, and you can contact us. You can find our all of our, you can find this report and all of our work at glisten.org slash research. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, you can um, find the spot to join our email newsletter there. And you follow us on, on Twitter and you can email us um, with any questions that you have after this webinar um, at glistenresearch at glisten.org. And Katie, is it is this correct uh, that, us, that we'll be sending a survey or a survey will come out about this webinar if you registered for it or if you attended? Is that the case? That's not the case. Never mind. I don't know. Maybe. Audience. I thought that was the case. Oh, well. Um, one of the staff who was really our, we call it like sort of the AV club for the Glisten Research Institute, uh, unfortunately is no longer with us uh, this year. So I, we're sort of picking up new knowledge. Anyway, um, is, is, is that it now? That is, that is it. Ah, thank you. Anyway. Thank you so much. It was great to have you all here. Please write us if you have questions. Look for the recording. Uh, tell family, friends, colleagues all about it. Hello, Asanglis and Research. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and we'd love to hear from you. So really do reach out. And also special, special shout out to Leash. This was their first webinar. So they were amazing. So thank you for that. Um, I mean, Katie was amazing as well, but you know, she has a track record of being amazing. This is Leash's first time. So yay, thank you for that. So it's a great team. They worked really hard over the last six months to get this report out. I am forever grateful. Um, for their work and glisten and the movement. So thank you for that. And thank you, Joe. <laughs>
Whatever. Thank everyone for joining us. <laughs> Be in touch. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.